Okay, now we're going to be looking at another fly uh, family. This is a fly family that shows up every once in a while on bodies, or it'll show up uh, oh, near some sort of decomposing remains, things like that. What's nice about these is it's pretty easy just to tell on sight, and there's really only one species that you need to know about when it comes to forensic entomology. So we're gonna be looking at Foridae. So Foridae are commonly known as the scuttleflies, the humpback flies, or the coffin flies. So uh, these are really interesting little flies, and they are small. They look a lot like uh, Drosophila. They look a lot like uh, fruit flies. In fact, when I first started rearing uh, flies, uh, in, say in a lab or something like that, I was... Uh, confused because these flies will get into any type of, type of decomposing substance. So there I've got in my cage for the first time. I'm in a lab. Uh, you know, I think I was rearing Compsomyopes calopes, something like that. So I'm rearing that out. And then I come in one day and it looks like there's a whole mess of fruit flies just in this cage. And I'm new to forensic entomology, so I don't know what the hell is going on. I'm asking around and, you know, there's like a fruit fly expert, like those aren't fruit flies. And so I, I eventually find out that, that they're forward flies. And, you know, you have to play it off. Someone's like, oh, those look like 40. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, 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 40. So I want to tell you what these are. So they look like fruit flies. They're about that size. They're very, very tiny. And they're considered to be one of the most diversified group of insects out there. This is simply because they have a very wide range of ecological backgrounds and morphological features. So they look really crazy and different from one another, but they all fall into the same family. Now, there are more than 3,500 species of Foridae worldwide, and they have a huge diversity of shapes. They inhabit a bunch of different resources, uh, probably because they are so small. So they're very small flies. They range from 0.4 to 6 millimeters on average, so much smaller than uh, most of these other flies that we've been looking at. So just imagine a bunch of fruit flies flying around the uh, um, a body. That's what we're looking at here. In fact, this family includes the smallest fly in the world. And that's the picture that I've got up here at the top for you. This is Europladia. I'm not even going to try to say that uh, species today. It, it is from Thailand. And these flies are hardcore. The, this tiny fly and a couple of other species in uh, Foridae have the habit, fantastic habit, of attacking ants. So they will attack these small ants. And what they do, as you can see what's going on in this video here, they will fly up and boom, just uh, oviposit an egg in the thorax of these ants. And that uh, maggot will then hatch out and take over the ant's brain. And it'll eat that brain and then decapitate the ant. So this is a fantastic way of really controlling ants. So a slightly larger species will do this to fire ants. There's other species that prey upon other different ant species. We're actually looking into using these forids to control the invasive fire ant in the southern regions of the U.S. And so it's just crazy and awesome. So there's a, a couple of groups that are releasing these little tiny forid flies in order to control these ants. The problem is, is these forids are also annoying, like uh, muskets are. So when you get a forid infestation in a lab and when you're doing a lot of rearing of meat and rearing meat, when you're doing flies where you need to use meat to rear them, oh man, you get forids like there's no tomorrow. And these forids will just sort of fly around, they'll land in your coke, they'll just be all over your keyboard. It's just awful. So anyhow, bleh. Um, so most of these species are decomposers. Uh, they're going to deposit their eggs on decaying animal or plant material. Uh, so m uh, most of them we will see on decomposing remains. Not all of them will go after ants like this. There are a few different common names, if you may have noticed. So the scuttlefly is probably the, the most um, well-known name for these flies. And it's named the scuttlefly because it these flies have a propensity to run erratically across uh, carcasses and, and across surfaces. They do this instead of flying. So they will run in these quick, short bursts, and it'll uh, follow by these little short pauses. So they just sort of scuttle around. What's nice is it makes it very easy to identify them when they're out in the field in the adult stage. So they're just sort of scuttling instead of flying. 
Now, uh, the other major names are the coffin flies or the humpback flies. So the coffin flies are called as such because they have the ability to feed on buried bodies. So they will get into coffins and feed on the bodies inside. The humpback flies are called that because if you see on, uh, when you look at the side of this or the the lateral surface of this fly, you can sort of see they're of a rounded thorax region. They look like they have a humped back. Hence the name humpback flies. So scuttle flies, humpback flies, or coffin flies, just based on where people have noticed that they're found. Now, the hosts for these uh, flies, these flies are found on a lot of different types of rotting substances. You might find them in your house. They're going to be feeding on things like rotting bags of potatoes. They're going to be feeding on fecal material. They love open septic tanks. They love rotting humans and animals. Any like small bit of rotting meat or rotting something they can show up on. So they're very common flying around areas that have buried bodies. So we can see them in mausoleums or in crypts, and this can cause a lot of problems. Now, forward flies are found worldwide, though they have the greatest variety of species in the tropics. So they're just like most other species. Uh, most other insects where they're much more diverse in the really warm tropical areas. Now, uh, the larvae are found or can be found in nests of social insects. So like the uh, ants here, so in the species that parasitize ants or, uh, or parasitoids of ants, they'll, they'll be found there. They can also be found in some aquatic habitats and mostly in, orga in organic detritus. Uh, some species feed on a uh, fungi or on the mycelium of living plants. Some are leaf miners. Some are predators. Some are parasites of earthworms, snails, spiders, centipedes. So we see a lot of this diversity in what the larval uh, flies feed upon. The adults feed on nectar and honeydew primarily, although they will feed on juices that extrude from fresh carrion, from fresh dung. So they, they like that liquid food. There are some adults that do feed on bodily fluids of living beetle larvae and pupae. Others will prey upon small insects. And then several species will feed just inside coffins, hence the coffin flies, that they will continue living for many, many generations in buried coffins. So we see this huge uh, variety in where they're going to feed. That's why this is one of the most diverse uh, families in uh, in Diptera. So and in amongst all families, it's just the amount of things that they're able to feed upon and the amount of life cycles they're, they're uh, able to have is just ridiculous. Now, because they frequent unsanitary places, so all this gross rotting stuff, they um, can have the ability to transport disease-causing organisms to food material. So they are a pest in different arenas. So if you find them in, say, a restaurant, they could be feeding in the drain that is clogged or on rotting uh, meat or food substances in the back. So those can be a problem. Now, the overall uh, appearance of these flies, they're tiny. They're usually black, brown, or yellowish with this humped or this rounded thoracic region. They do have a smaller, low head and very dark eyes. So they're pretty easy to ID. At least any small little flying fruit fly looking thing, I usually call a forid unless told otherwise. And in a little bit, I'm going to actually give you a case study where I made that mistake. Now, uh, they do have particular veining on their wings. So their costal vein extends only about halfway along the anterior of the wing margin. Um, they've got some weak veins posteriorly that aren't really connected to cross veins. So they, they've got these sort of long veins in their wings that don't have a lot of cross veins. Now, their hind femora are enlarged and flattened. So you can really see that right here. So these large uh, flattened hind femora and the hind legs are very long. Their antennae appear to be one segmented. So that's what the adults look like sort of overall. If you're going down to a particular species, they will have individual characteristics. Now the forward flies have holometabolous metamorphosis like all flies. So they go from egg into uh, three larval instars. They will pupate and then emerge as the adults. So the female lays from one to 100 teensy tiny eggs at a time. 
um, either in or on the larval food. So she doesn't lay, lay them uh, in clutches the same way that Californi do. She lays them individually, especially those that are preying upon ants. I mean, they're just sort of shot into the thorax of these ants. Uh, so she can lay a variety of eggs at once, but they tend to be singularly laid across uh, uh, the substrate. Now, she can lay up to 750 eggs in her lifetime, and then the eggs, the time it takes to go from egg to adult varies with the species and with the temperature, of course, but on average, it takes about 25 days. So the larvae will emerge in about a day, about 24 hours after oviposition, and they'll feed for a uh, period between 8 and 16 days, and then they'll crawl to a drier spot in order to pupate, of course. Uh, now, many species of these forward flies are specialist parasitoids of ants. And so we see these especially common in the tropics. Uh, some are parasitoids of things like stingless bees, so they really like feeding on those hymenoptera. Now, uh, the affected bees, the affected ants, are often host to more than one fly larvae. And so there are some individuals that have found up to 20 or 12 forward larvae all at once. So their life cycle is dependent upon their host. So you do see a different um, timing in these parasitoids than you do with uh, the ones that feed on rotting material. Now there are some species that will develop just directly in fungi or maybe pests of cultivated mushrooms, but the ones that we care about are those that are uh, decomposers. Now, there is one species that you are going to run into in forensic entomology. This is the most the most common for genus you're going to find in general is Megacelia. And uh, this is the largest genus in the family Foridae. There's about 1,400 named species. So based on just that sheer number, by far the largest uh, genus in Foridae. Now, I've said that a couple of times now. That's because I just wrote the questions for this uh, the quiz questions for the slide. So guess what my quiz question was? Yeah, which is the largest genus in the family Foridae. So it's Megacelia. About 1,400 named species. Uh, and really, in all likelihood, there's um, a lot more species out there that just are not named or described. So, you know, this is something you could go into if you're super into super teensy tiny flies and taxonomy. You can name a few species. Name one after me. Now, of the Megacelia, the one species you will run into is Megacelia scalaris. So this is very, very commonly associated with rotting meat, with dead bodies, that sort of thing. This was the species that was infesting my colony when I was rearing it in the lab for the first time. This is the species that I see just constantly all over the place on uh, bodies. So when they are there, it's this species. Now, the adult female will oviposit eggs from 1 to 100 eggs all at once. Um, Depending on the condition of the female, that's going to determine how many eggs she's able to lay. So the better fed she is, the more uh, eggs she's able to lay, and she will just sort of scatter these eggs individually over the substrate. Now, M. scalaris eggs are somewhat boat-shaped, so they have an average length of 0.5 millimeters, so they're half a millimeter long, so they're tiny. They're similar in size to the fruit fly, Drosophila, Drosophila melanogaster, so the major fruit fly that everybody studies. It's about that size of egg, so they're tiny. Uh, the structure of the, of the egg, though, it allows them to be oviposited into liquid environments, like decomposing material. So they're fine with super gooey bodies or super uh, liquidy substrates. Egg development rate, of course, it depends on temperature. The optimal time is about nine hours. So uh, their optimal temperature is about 93 degrees Fahrenheit, and it takes nine hours for them to hatch at that temperature. So the egg will hatch into the first of three larval instars, and the larvae are tiny. They're cylindrical. Uh, they're tapering towards the head. They're cream in color, and they average about three millimeters in length uh, once they get their full size. So you can see here, this is a little first instar larvae. This is the pupae. So, I mean, this is what a third instar larvae looks like. They're, they're tiny, three millimeters. First instar, much, much smaller, about 0.5 millimeters long, in fact, so about the size of the egg. Now, uh, they will pupate in about 55 to 65 hours at 93 degrees Fahrenheit. So at their optimal temperature, low 90s, it'll take them just over two days 
to go through those three larval instars. Now, the larvae of M. scalaris uh, consume a wider range of organic material than any other insect out there. They're ridiculous. The larvae can attack living plants on occasion. On occasion. Under crowded conditions, they become facultative uh, predators and parasites of other invertebrates. So they will just go out and find food. They will also parasitize vertebrates, including humans, and they can cause both wound and internal myiasis. So we have many cases of them causing myiasis on living humans. Now, when M. scalaris feeds, they're actually feeding on particles of organic matter suspended in fluid. This is why they're able to go into all these different substrates because they're, they're looking for the liquid and they're so tiny, they're actually just going for these organic particles. In many cases, this fluid is rich with microorganisms. So think about a big open wound. It's like a really nasty infected wound. It's, there's pus and there's grossness in there. They're just feeding on those microorganisms in the fluid. So organic matter in solid form is first liquefied, usually by that uh, exodigestion, that secretion of digestive enzymes into potential food, and then they're going to ingest those suspended food particles. So the larvae then are going to concentrate those food particles, and they're going to eliminate the excess liquid in the process. So uh, the larvae have these sort of dorsal expansions on their, these dorsal lateral expansions on their body, which kind of help act as a sieve as they are feeding on these particles. And these particles are going to uh, pass backwards above these expansions and they will be uh, sieving out the particles with that, from that liquid and ingesting it. Now, the pupae are elongate, they're oval, this is what they look like, and these pupae are really easy to ID. So they're tiny, they're about four millimeters long, and they have these little processes that come off this anterior end. So it's these little, almost look like uh, bristles coming off this end, and they're usually dorsoventrally flattened. So you get these sort of little flat, oval, rounded uh, pupae with these processes. You've got forehead flies. Just very, very easy to ID. Now, um, down to species, a lot of forehead, uh, a lot of the megacellia especially, can have these processes, but it's likely megacellia sclerosis in uh, anywhere in North America where you're dealing with decomposing meat. Now, the male larvae, um, they take a little less time uh, to pupariate. So they take a, both males and females take approximately 170 hours to go through their pupil development, but the male larvae will turn into pupae approximately two days earlier than the female larvae. And the pupil periods of the males are a little bit shorter. So they will close from their pupil casings a little bit earlier than the females. Uh, this might be because they need to feed and mature their sperm so that they're ready to mate with females as soon as the females emerge. Now, the adults are, are average about three millimeters in length. So again, they're tiny. They vary in color from light brown to yellow. And they have this uh, characteristic, very thickened and shortened costal wing vein. So that is one of the easiest ways to tell them underneath a microscope. But you don't really need to worry about that until you get into taxonomy of these forensically important flies. Now, depending on temperature, uh, they can survive for about one to two months as adults. Now, the females are receptive to males approximately 24 hours after they are closed from the pupil casing. So they are ready to mate very, very quickly after eclosion, whereas males do not mate until they are four days old. So that's probably one of the reasons why the males are eclosing two days before the females are out there, because they want to make sure they are ready to uh, as early as possible to uh, mate with these newly closed females. Now, during courtship, the male performs a number, number of these like complex wing and leg movements, sort of a dance that they do. Uh, they uh, will also uh, sort of fly around and then the females are going to respond with this lateral wagging movement of the abdomen. So it's this complex dance that they've evolved in order to mate. Now, uh, they will couple and then the females will be transported by the males during nuptial flight. So they mate in flight and the duration of the typical mating flight is about 32 seconds. 
so many jokes that can make here, but I won't. But it ranges from 16 to 148 seconds uh, uh, in general. So about 32 seconds for this coupling to happen. Now, M. Scalaris has the adults have this extraordinary capacity to penetrate into or escape from seemingly closed containers. So if you have a nearly closed off or sealed container or a sealed body, you may still find Scalaris there. So they're the ones that can get there. So investigators have reported that M. Scalaris has been able to escape through eight layers of stretched gauze. It's a pain in the butt to try to rear these things because they can just get out of any cage and then they just take over your lab. And like I said, they just, they're they super annoying. Now, uh, they uh, showed that M. Scalaris can also invade plastic bags. They can get into turtle eggs. They can actually get through uh, the knots tied in the necks of plastic bags, so even tied up bags. And then the first instar larvae can enter turtle eggs through larger pores in those eggs. So we see infestation of these eggs even with the Scalaris. So they're really good at what they do. And they can do this very, very quickly. So they can locate insects that die in laboratory cultures or in rearing containers uh, really, really fast after those insects die. So if you're rearing larger insects like uh, oh, uh, cockroaches or something, you will get forward flies as those cockroaches die or beetles or whatever else. So it's crazy what they can do. So they use these olfactory uh, cues to find recently dead organisms very, very fast. Now, M. scalaris has been involved in all manner of different types of forensic cases. There's three major types that they, they are used in on a regular basis. The first is contamination of food. So they will contaminate decomposing food matter. So there are many, many cases out there where they've estimated the earliest oviposition date from the oldest specimen present to determine the origin of a contamination of food, whether it involves the producer, the wholesaler, or the retailer. So we've seen M. scalaris in cracked eggs. We've seen them in various other uh, rotten food types. So they do help in that uh, stored products entomology. Uh, where you will see them is primarily in medical criminal entomology. But we, like I said, we do see them in urban forensic entomology in the case of myiasis. But we, we most commonly see them in invasion of human corpses. So they can help us do a time of colonization estimation. Uh, blowflies, if they're unable to get to a body, the forids are usually able to get there. So the smaller forids are able to enter through the tiniest of openings. So there have been cases where M. scalaris was the only insect found breeding in a body that was in a tightly sealed seventh floor apartment in Japan. Uh, in the absence of other insects, uh, the population of M. scalaris larvae may be at extremely high levels. So gravid females can arrive at beef baits within 24 hours of exposure. So they're very quick. So they're among that first wave finding corpses that are indoors because they can get into places. Um, in certain countries like in e Egypt, M. scalaris is the only uh, fly that moves around during the winter months. So the only thing that find carcasses in the winter, and this is well after Californian sarcophagidae have gone dormant for the winter months. So there's all manner of uh, cases where we use M. scalaris because it's the only one there. All right, so that's the fority, and that's as far as we're going to go with the fority. Uh, up next, we're going to do a little bit more flies, and we'll move on to the beetles. Let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> 